Good afternoon. Hey everybody. So I'm mindful of the fact that we are, uh, we stand, I believe, are we the last one before beer? Yes. We are the last one before beer. Okay, so we, we understand that. Um, <laughs> we'll take that responsibility to heart. My name is Jeff Norris. I lead a lab at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory called the Ops Lab. Victor Lowe is the deputy lead of that lab. I also want to single out Alex Menzies. Alex, stand up. Alex is the lead developer in our lab. Um, so we'd love to talk with anybody who likes what we're doing, wants to talk about it. You know, come find any of the three of us. Is Matt Clausen here? I don't know if he went to our other track. Well, uh, one of our uh, design leads is also bouncing around, Matt Clausen. I think he's in the education talk, though. Um, so what we want to talk about today in kind of two parts are a little more in-depth discussion of two applications that we've been building within our lab for space exploration. So we're doing a lot of different projects, and we highlighted uh, one during the keynote today. We're not going to be talking about the spacecraft design application in this talk. We're going to focus on our Mars applications and our space station applications. So I'm going to do the first part about the Mars stuff, and Victor's going to talk about the space station. So I want to th you to think about the origins of science and astronomy. Our first scientific instrument for observing our universe is our eye. And it is just impossible to overstate the importance of this instrument. First of all, it is remarkable, the eye. It can distinguish nearly 10 million different colors. It requires only about five photons striking your retina to generate an electrical impulse in your brain. It's a marvelous instrument, which makes it a little surprising that we felt that we still needed to augment it. And we have. We've built marvelous telescopes like this one, which is about as steampunk as a telescope as I've ever seen. That's a real telescope. Love this thing. And this one here, which is from a different era, that's Edwin Hubble looking through a telescope. Uh, and here's another one. This one's a special one. See, that's Percival Lowell. And Lowell is probably most famous for the drawings that he did after observing Mars that showed canals on the surface of Mars. Later, you know, we learned that there were not canals on Mars, but um, Percival Lowell um, influenced science and science fiction uh, for really um, many, many, many years after his death. Here he is looking through the 24-inch Clark ref uh, refractor, uh, his primary telescope. After Lowell studied Mars, he also studied Venus. And he drew these amazing pictures of Venus because he saw these linear structures on the surface of Venus that he were con convinced represented some kind of a surface feature that for some reason stayed always facing to the Earth. So he theorized that Venus was somehow locked in its rotation so that the same side was always facing Earth because these, these figures didn't seem to move across the planet. Now later, we discovered that Venus is completely obscured by clouds. You can't see surface features. And so the question raised, what was Lowell seeing on Venus? What, what was he drawing a picture of? Well, this is a picture of the blood vessels in your eye. <laughs> Lowell had adjusted the Clark refractor um, in a particular way that made it function kind of as a giant ophthalmoscope, which meant that it was actually casting shadows of the blood vessels in his eye onto his retina. So as Lowell felt that he was mapping the surface of Venus, he was really mapping the surface of his own eye, which is it's poetic and uh, remarkable. It brings us, though, to this observation, which is... Uh, you know, one that I really have to give some credit to, to Alex Menzies here, because he's, he's pointed it out, about the role of VR and how it can act as kind of a new telescope for us. See, when you look at these three amazing telescopes and all the other advances in telescopes ever made, I want to point out a very important component common to every one of them that has never been upgraded, and that is us, the human. The human observer is sort of this fixed part of this observational system. And so we better get comfortable with this component because we can't change it, we can't replace it. The brain that we are stuck with evolved to make some very important distinctions 
that really have nothing to do with what these gentlemen are doing here. They have to do with things like this and also this. Our brains and senses were evolved to keep us alive, not necessarily to study a distant planet and decide whether there were features on the surface of Venus. And when we're confronted with these pictures of another world taken out of context, without any points of reference that we're used to seeing in our natural world, we can fall into perceptual traps and make ridiculous judgments like this one. The core problem is that there is nothing natural about what Percival Lowell is doing here in terms of his brain and his senses. The brain was not designed or evolved to look at the universe or the world this way. And so we are constantly, as we use an instrument this way, forcing ourselves to make mental translations to make this still make sense for us. And that is a problem because we're in a species that can explore like this, and yet we're exploring like that. And this got us very excited. Astronomy, modern astronomy, has in really many ways made this even worse because we've removed even the feeling that comes from turning a telescope with your hands to point it in different directions. And we've put everything behind screens and keyboards. And so when it became time for us to start exploring the surface of Mars, we did it the same way because there was really no other option. We explore Mars from behind a computer screen even though we know that the reality of Mars is this, far more rich, far more complicated, detailed. So we started working on ways to break through those boundaries. And this is some really early work we did in this area where we took early Oculus units and stuck tracking balls on them with the Vicon Bonita in our lab and started experimenting with what would it be like if we could engage the positional somatosensory and proprioceptive senses in the human brain let people walk around on Mars. And it turns out remarkable things happened. We, um, you know, I'll just mention we experimented with different ways of rendering, mixtures of 2D and 3D rendering. This is all, you know, several years old um, work now. But we found this, and this has become a, an important result for us. We did a study where we took members of the science teams on the um, Curiosity and Spirit and Opportunity Mars rover missions, and we asked them to complete a task with data acquired by the Curiosity rover. And what we found was that there was a dramatic, and measurable, and statistically significant effect on their understanding of the vicinity of the data acquired by the Mars rover when they were wearing a head-mounted display. And I'll just go just briefly into a little more detail on this diagram. So there are two kinds of error in the axes of this graph. Uh, the left Vertical axis is angular error accumulated for a subject, and the x-axis there is the accumulated distance error. So high error or poor performance is in the top right-hand corner of that graph, and excellent performance or low error is in the bottom left-hand corner. So each one of those marks on the graph is one of our experimental subjects. The red x's are people using the official mission operations tool that we use every day to operate the Curiosity rover mission, which was built in my lab, and then those green circles are the performance of individuals using the head-mounted display who had had zero training with the technology. We brought them in, put it on their head, gave them about 30 seconds to look around, and told them to make a map of their surroundings. I want you to note that everybody was good at that without training, and I believe the reason for that is that we were effectively just asking them to be human. And uh, that result, this result, sent us really out into the world to push this work along much more quickly. Uh, we have partnered with a lot of people on this journey. This is some work we did with uh, the fine people at Sony Magic Labs. You're seeing here a more detailed 3D rendering. I uh, apologize, this is one of those captures from inside a VR headset, so it has the you know, distortion that comes with that. And then more recently, work uh, with Microsoft and the HoloLens and a project that we call OnSite. And OnSite, our kind of latest effort in this area, has this simple goal, which is that we want scientists to work together on Mars while still being in their office. We want to bring the surface of Mars into their offices, let them explore the red planet as geologists have learned to explore Earth. And the reason why we're excited about this is, is that we already know that humans are phenomenal explorers. We've been doing it as long as we've been humans. So if we can let people explore Mars in the same ways that they've learned to explore Earth, in the more natural 
way that virtual and augmented reality enables, then we think we can make them more effective. And we already have a small pilot group of scientists who are just starting to use this now in the operation of the Curiosity Mars rover today. It's early days and we have a lot more work to do to discover how to, to change our mission operational paradigm to one that uses a technology like this, but we're already uh, on our way. This is a 3D rendering, I'm sorry, this is, a, uh, this is what the terrain looks like in the on-site program. So uh, Alex and the rest of the terrain team have come up with a way to build the most detailed and high fidelity 3D rendering of Mars that's ever been created. And it includes data from our orbiters, automatically combined with multiple locations of surface data acquisition to build one contiguous mesh, which then gets textured with data acquired from all those different rover locations. And at every spot on the terrain, we're automatically deciding which image from the rover would offer the highest spatial resolution for that location. So that's what produces this. You'll notice, for example, there's no rover in it because we can image the area underneath rover, the rover because the rover acquired that data from another location. Um, so this is, uh, this is the quality of the terrain that we have in that tool today. So I'm going to transition to Victor here now. We're thinking out there at Mars, right? Well. We, we have a, another vanguard of exploration within NASA, which is the human exploration. And we, in my lab, don't want to neglect that part either. And so we've also been building some applications to support the uh, space station as well. Thanks, Jeff. Let's take a moment and imagine we're an astronaut. This is actually something that I do a little bit too often, I think. <laughs> actually, let's imagine we're this guy. This is astronaut Scott Kelly and he's been in space for an entire year now. By the time he gets back, he'll have been in space for a collective amount of more than 500 days. That's more than any other human being has been in space. And this is where he lives. Right above the curvature of the Earth lies the International Space Station, or ISS for short. Here he lives with five of his best friends from around the world in a space of you know, the size of a football field with a volume of about a six-bedroom house. And there, they perform experiments looking down on Earth and inside the zero-g environment, they perform dozens of experiments every single day. And for the past year, Scott Kelly himself has been an experiment. Now, the space station, with all its components and computers and electronics, the things that have to keep the astronauts alive, is perhaps the most complicated man-made machine that's ever been built. And these six people that operate it every single day are expected to keep it in tip-top shape. And that's a very hard job to do. In the past, when it was a much simpler living space and when the astronauts weren't expected to live there as much, they could do a lot of this training on, on the ground, train up everything that they needed to perform, and then memorize all that and perform it on station. But nowadays, with experiments that are three to six months long to even a year out long, it's impossible to keep track of everything that they are expected to perform. So what do they do? Well, to close the gap, they literally have instruction manuals for every single procedure that they do on board. And not all these procedures are easy to understand. This is what an actual procedure on the space station looks like. And this is actually a procedure for what happens if there's a fire on board the space station. So you can imagine if there's an emergency going on and they have to stop and read this to figure out what to do next. That's kind of ridiculous to think about all the off nominal or, or uncommon things that might happen on board. But even just looking at a procedure like this, there's a lot of complexities involved. All these acronyms, all these components that you're expected to find, just understanding the context of what you're trying to experiment with, all the environments, all the, all the pieces that you need to grab, is very taxing for the astronaut. They have to go grab all these pieces, and when they're actually performing the experiment, the, the distance that they cover between the, uh, where they look at the procedure and where they operate the procedure is, is, is a very long distance. This is very time consuming. So we looked at this, and we saw an opportunity. We got really excited. What if we could build, for the first time, an immersive remote guidance tool that could connect the ground control, the mission control operators, with the astronauts on board the space station? 
and in real time walk them through these procedures as if they were there, drawing tools and adding procedures, you know, loading these things up as they were performing these procedures. And what if we could build this amazing tool on this unreleased commercial platform, certify for zero G flight, then dive underneath the water and certify for two atmospheric pressure and 100% humidity, and then get it, change the entire ISS network to handle this real time communication, and then manifest it on a commercial flight, all within a span of six months. Well, that's exactly what we did. And that was the beginning of Project Sidekick. So how does this, how would this something like this work? Well, oh, and this is Scott Kelly, and basically how Sidekick would work is it would be an interactive instruction manual, something that you saw before, but it would be interactive. It would give the crew, the astronauts, the ability to stay on top of exactly what they need to do as they're doing it. This is how it would work. So you're an astronaut, you're floating down the corridor, and your buddy Scott Kelly just finished packing the cargo ship that's going to return back to Earth. It's got hundreds of extremely valuable experiments, and it's your job to seal the hatch. This is what a hatch looks like. I don't know about you, but I have no idea what to do with that. So what will we do in this case? Well, we bust out our handy sidekick application, and all of a sudden, immediately, we see the end state. We see what it should look like once we're done packing the hatch. And with our handy sidekick tool, immediately we've got overlays showing us instructions about where to put this thing there, and as we you know, walk through the procedures, the application is hand-holding us, showing us animations and diagrams, everything we need to know as we're doing it. And the things that, as the things get more complicated, is showing more details. Literally holding our hands, it's as if we've been doing this millions of times before. Of course, we had to set, test this and certify all this technology for spaceflight. So the first thing we did and something I highly recommend everyone in this room do at least once in your lifetime, is go on the world's coolest roller coaster, also known as NASA's Weightless Wonder. It's basically a giant DC-9 737-sized aircraft, completely gutted with padding and straps, and it would go on these crazy 2G ups and downs that lasted about 60 seconds. And every 60 seconds, we had about 20 seconds of free float time time when we can do spins and rolls and supermans, and that's when we could collect the valuable data that we needed to make sure it would work in space. And literally two weeks after this, I dived down 60 feet deep to this crazy, awesome environment called NEMO. Now, NEMO is what we call a spacecraft analog, so it's, it's a piece of the space station embedded underneath the Atlantic Ocean. And it's, it's, we put it down there so that it's very easy for astronauts to go in and out of the habitat and live down there comfortably for about two to three weeks. And they live down there to perform a variety of experiments, experiments including activities that might be performed on board the space station, but we need to test it out before we do it. So we were one of those experiments. But the cool thing about our experiment was that other experiments used us to make their jobs be more easy. So for example, there was a task that was expected to last an entire afternoon, and we were able to accomplish that in less than an hour. So these cost savings, these findings from these trips were extremely valuable for us, and for the first time we felt like you know, we were on the right track. The hardest part of the certification was actually trying to figure out the network between the ISS and ground control. So I don't know if you guys know this, but currently the best way for astronauts to use the internet on board the space station is they have to get on their VPN, remote desktop into a computer that's physically in mission control. And then they move the mouse cursor that's of the computer on the ground to navigate and browse the internet. That's an insane amount of latency and something that we can definitely not, so definitely not be able to support our real time interactive remote guidance tools. So what we had to do was be very careful about opening just the right amount of internet so that we could maintain the safety and integrity of the space station network while allowing the communication of real-time um, networks. 
Now, after all of that was done, I mean, we made sure that the device was certified with all its emitters and sensors, we got to put it on the manifest for our rocket launch. For many of us, the first rocket launch ever. And within the span of about six months, we basically tested every single part of our project, everything that could physically go wrong before we tested it out on board the space station. But nothing could really prepare ourselves for what happened next. Because about two and a half minutes into the launch, this happened. An incredible amount of pressure was detected on one side of the spacecraft, and all of a sudden it just exploded into millions of pieces across the Atlantic Ocean. And along with that, our project. So it was a very sad moment for our project, but also a humble reminder of how difficult space exploration is, but that it should never deter us when something goes wrong. Because exactly six months later, we did it again, and it worked. Everything, all the work we put together in the last six, year, uh, six months to a year had been extremely valuable because Jeff, myself, and the rest of our team had put something into space. It took us about a whole year to get our project off the ground. And in that year, Scott Kelly has performed hundreds of experiments on board the space station, collecting immensely valuable data that's going to be important for us as we push the limits of, space effort, uh, of human space exploration. And it's on his to-do list to try our experiment before he returns back to Earth. So <clears throat> you may be wondering, you know, why, why, are, why are we doing this stuff? What, what's all of this leading towards? We, um, you know, we're looking forward, I hope, like you are, to a future with a human expedition to Mars. And um, something I believe very much that we're all going to see. Looking forward to that. And we believe that the technologies that we're showing here and that have been discussed throughout, you know, Vision Summit today, are going to be instrumental in every phase of that mission. We think we're going to use it to design the spacecraft that takes our astronauts to Mars. We think we're going to use these technologies to assist the astronauts on board the spacecraft on the way and when they arrive, to increase their autonomy so that they can perform the tasks that they need to on Mars without having to be helped as much from the ground. And then when they arrive, that we're going to support them, help them, as telenauts here on Earth, through tools like our Mars exploration uh, tool that I showed earlier. So that's how we think all of these things are, are coming together to enable the next chapter in humanity's exploration of space. So I'm going to conclude and take some questions. Uh, Tim Merrill from iTouch um, Reality. Because you can't risk a spark inside a spacesuit, mm -hmm. something with a battery in it, you're not going to be able to use. So how are you thinking about adapting what you've achieved for functions inside the space station for when actually you've got astronauts outside on a spacewalk? Uh, so make sure I understand the question. You're asking, how could we do the work that we're doing? How could we extend it into the inside of a space suit? Yeah, well, basically, uh, because you can't put a battery, something you've just got a battery that could spark inside a spacesuit. So it's not an area that we're working on yet, um, our team. So we, we are, you know, starting out with the in, intravehicular, you know, environment um, rather than the extravehicular vehicular environment. The, uh, you know, I could certainly imagine, hope all of you could, seeing these kinds of technologies integrated into a future spacesuit in a way that would you know, address the, the kinds of safety concerns that have to be observed inside a spacesuit. Um, you know, something perhaps that gets integrated into the helmet itself. But it's not something that we're working on right now. We want to prove this technology out inside the craft and then you know, perhaps look forward to more things beyond. I mean, Thank just you. to be clear, we can't have a battery that sparks inside a space station e either, right? It's, it's almost the most dangerous place because it's very small, confined space and abundance of oxygen. So part of our certification was making sure that we had the right sensors and batteries that would not spark or explode in space. Cool. Thank you for saving the astronauts. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> So uh, the LA Times made that mobile JavaScript um, Mars VR experience. Um, 
did you collaborate with them and can you go into the details of that and also how do other developers collaborate with you for some of these uh, for some of this data so our, our team did not um, collaborate directly with them but um, more generally though it makes us really excited to see whether it's other companies or people in the general public out there trying to build new things with the data that we give away, um, and because it, you know, we do want to give our data away. So I, I hope that that continues. We're really excited to see people doing that. Um, in terms of uh, you know working with us, we're uh, we're a small team. We have a, you know a lab of maybe around a dozen people working on virtual and augmented reality technologies at JPL. We're not the only team within NASA that's interested in this technology. There are others that are looking at it for some of their own purposes and, and goals. Uh, so I don't really have anything more specific to say than you know we we do welcome people reaching out to us. I'd say we're most excited right now. Not exclusively, but most excited about partnering with people who are bringing new devices into this field, people perhaps looking at new displays or new input devices. Uh, also excited to talk with people who are looking at how to build better de development frameworks and reusable components uh, to help you know, make the creation of these applications a little more standardized and easy to make. Add to that. I mean, you saw the beautiful terrain, Mars terrain, in, the, in this, con this conversation that we just had. We are working actively to make that type of data open to developers, to you guys, so that you can build applications on top of that. But uh, that's something we were happy to talk more about. Yeah, one of the nice things about our job is that we, we, are, we are supposed to give it all away. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, so having done enough work in this field, th these are, and as other people will talk about, this is, these are lots of moving target technologies. And so as any, lots of developers will know, like, Oh great, new Unity update came out and everything broke and your rendering pipeline's broken and whatnot. You, working in your uh, organization, there's much, in certain parts at least, there's much higher standards of like uh, how software is developed and, um, and you clearly have lots of experience doing inter and uh, like working with outside groups and in uh, those kind of partnerships is the, um, has the, the VR experience uh, in terms of working with this new hardware, had to, have you had to adjust your, your process or do you have any best practices for those of us that are, um, I mean, if you screw up, you lose a rocket and astronauts and stuff. If I screw up, a demo doesn't work quite right. So it's the. I mean, there's part of our projects that you can think of as just as an indie studio. So we're, we're incubating, we're coming up with ideas and we can change up our tool set all the time, just like you guys. And then there are parts of the projects that are flight missions, right? Things like the astronauts you mentioned, things like on Mars, where it takes some time to, to vet that through, making sure that we test this thoroughly, beta test it in this controlled environment, making sure that we're, actually, we're not actually driving the rover with the tools we build until to a point where it's, it's, we deem it safe. Yeah, I, mean, I would say we've made a conscious decision um, not to just wait around until everything settles down. We're a lab that has you know, adopted leading edge technologies for, for some time now. That's the way we want to do it. And so I, I believe you know, we, we have to be careful. We have to apply the appropriate care in the appropriate situation. But we're, we're not just going to, to wait till the whole market settles down. That's not where we want to be. We want to be helping to, to drive this medium forward, helping to um, you know, develop things on top of it as the industry develops. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you had the problem of uh, streaming in real time between the space station and ground control. I was wondering what kind of data you actually had to stream from Earth, or are there constraints on the amount of data that you can actually have on the space station, like the contents of the training manual and stuff like that? It's yours. Yeah, I, I mean, there's just a limited pipeline, right? Uh, there's a limited bandwidth between Earth and the space station, and currently that's I mean, there's different bandwidth, so there, there's a certain band for just like voice communication, there's a different band for like video conference communication, but there's never been a dedicated line for live internet communication. And that's sort of the thing that we've explored most on this project. Yeah, it's a constraint we deal with. And latency is another challenge we deal with. You know, everything from space station latency out to Mars latency, which is five to 25 minutes one way by the speed of light. Oh, absolutely. There's, I think, more than 50 computers on board the space station. So, yeah, a lot, all of the procedures are stored in a database on board the space station. But, you know, it gets synced every now and then. 
So my, my sign is saying, please wrap up. So I think we should take one more question and then um, we'll be here. We'll be here. We're going to hang out at the reception. There's and nothing after us. I don't so. think there's anything after us except for booze. And, you know, obviously that's not important. So We'll be there too. Yeah. Wondering what Yeah, I think they cut his mic. You're asking, and I will answer your last question. Um, how, uh, how does zero gravity interact with the device? How do other elements of the space environment interact with the device? Yes. So he's asking if we had to do anything special to make sure that, for instance, AR works in space. And yeah, you saw the video of it. You know, we took it in the vomit comment. And um, that is how you figure out if something's going to work in space. It's the best analog that we, we have. Um, we wouldn't have gone to the, the expense and complexity of that test um, for any other reason than to make sure that it was going to function in the weightless or free fall, better term, um, environment of the space station. So thank you guys very much. Happy to answer more questions later.